So we have 63 people with us today in the audience and, and welcome to all, all of you. It's really great to see so many enthusiastic people joining us for the new trainees. Well, welcome day in cellular pathology or histopathology. Really wonderful to have you here today. You've made a fantastic choice and we're, we're here to make sure that the next few years of your training are as good as they possibly can be. Um, some housekeeping rules, if I may. Um, firstly, to say that this is being recorded as a webinar, so you won't be able to see yourselves on the screen in the usual way, uh, but it will be recorded and released on the, web, on the website, on the RCPATH website in a week or so. You can ask questions in, in the chat function and you can vote on those as well, so please do go ahead as you like. So I have the team with me and I'm sure they will introduce themselves as they talk one by one. Um, I'm Nikki Cohen, I'm Professor of Medical Education at King's and I'm Clinical Director of Training and Assessment at the Royal College of Pathologists, so it's wonderful to have you here today. We have a programme that we hope is going to be useful. Um, we're going to talk through uh, the way that the programme fits together, the way that your curriculum will work, the way that assessments work, and move on to the pathology portal, which is something that we're really proud of here. So. I'm suspecting that most people will introduce themselves as they go, but perhaps Jenny is on the call at the moment, and I don't think Jenny is speaking. So Jenny, why don't you say hi quickly? Hi, everybody. I'm Jenny McGinney. I'm the training manager at the college. Nice. And Great also noise. Sandra, I don't think you're talking about portfolio later, but Sandra is the queen of portfolio. Over to you, Sandra. <laughs> Hi everyone, I'm Sandra Dua Crichton. I'm the assessment manager at the college, and one of my remit is the LEP system, which my colleague Michael will tell you about later on. Fantastic. So, listen, it's great to have you all here. Um, and I'm going to hand over now to Dr. Mike Osborne, who's our president, um, who's going to give you the proper welcome. Hello. My name is Professor Mike Osborne, and I'm president of the Royal College of Pathologists. I'd like to welcome you today to this, our new trainee day. Pathology is hugely important. 95% of every single healthcare interaction in the United Kingdom is underpinned by a pathology test, ranging from blood tests, to histology, to the multitude of other tests pathology offers. We are 17 specialties in pathology, and we welcome everybody from everywhere who is part of the pathology family to be represented by the college. And I would welcome you today. Our 17 subspecialties cover a diverse range of interests and areas of healthcare. Some of them are very, very directly patient contact related. So for example, we have specialties like hematology, microbiology and infection, where people may be involved in face-to-face -face clinics with patients and directly see them on a day-to-day -day patient care basis. Others of our specialties are far less directly patient-facing. So for example, some may be very laboratory-based with people rarely seeing patients in a face-to-face -face situation. For example, histopathology. However, all our specialties are vital to patient care and all our specialties are patient focused. You could not have healthcare without pathology. So we are a fantastic speciality within medicine as a whole. In addition to a variety of interaction with patients, <clears throat> some of our specialties are very laboratory based. So for example, again, histopathology, some of our clinical chemistry colleagues, and so forth. Others are much more based in other environments, be they in the clinic, in the terms of hematology, or in other areas, for example, forensic pathology, where people may very, very rarely go into a laboratory. And what this means is that there's a whole range of specialties within pathology, and there's something to suit everybody. But again, I must stress, all of our specialties are patient focused and play a vital role in patient care. Because of the wide range of specialties we cover, there is something for everyone. And within those, there are a huge range of opportunities within pathology. 
those opportunities range from healthcare on a patient to patient and case to case basis to other things like research and teaching. For example, research is an area where pathologists are always in demand, whatever specialty of pathology they belong to. Virtually no research can be undertaken without pathology input because it is so key to patient care and to interpreting the data and to interpreting the way that the, the research is designed, structured and run. So pathology is core to this. And what this means is that from a research perspective, if you would like to pursue an academic career, there will be likely opportunities for you. But similarly, if you are working as a pathologist doing diagnostic work, there are a whole range of research opportunities that will be open from a project to project basis for you if research is an area you are interested in. The opportunities are manifold in pathology for research. Similarly, in teaching, because pathology underpins all of healthcare, there are opportunities in a wide range of teaching for a wide range of people, from medical undergraduates to medical postgraduates of all medical specialties, but also allied healthcare professionals as well, be they nurses, mortuary staff, or people more loosely affiliated with healthcare who need to have interactions and teaching. I personally have been involved in teaching the police, the military and so forth. So there's a whole range of opportunities. And again, if teaching and training are areas of specific interest to you, there are large numbers of opportunities in pathology, whichever specialty you pursue. And the result of this range of specialties and range of opportunities is you can develop a career that really suits you, that really, really allows you to do things that you are interested in and to develop your area of expertise. In addition, because pathology is so wide ranging, there are lots of job opportunities in pathology. Job opportunities virtually anywhere within the United Kingdom or indeed around the world. And this means people can work where it is most convenient for them. In addition, Pathology is very, very family friendly. This means that it fits well with your work life balance and gives opportunities for people to pursue their interests outside of work, leading to a much better life work balance. Pathology is very flexible and this is becoming more so as IT and so forth develop, which means people are more able to work from home are more able to work flexibly, which means, again, work-life balance benefits. In terms of the college, the Royal College of Pathologists was formed 60 years ago and is here to support all our pathology specialties. This means that whatever specialty you are in, there is, the college is there to support you, to help you, and to, to lobby for you to have the support and resources you need to be able to provide the health care to your patients that you want to, that they deserve. So the college is there for you. Benefits in terms of the trainees include things, for example, like active trainee committee who feed into many of the activities of the college, giving us a trainee perspective, making sure the college never lose sight of the role of trainees and the importance of trainees the next generation of consultants. We've got a website that offers a whole range of resources specifically for trainees, and we are currently just about to launch the Pathology Portal, which is a superb online vehicle for learning for trainees and others. In addition to that, we run webinars, teaching sessions, and so forth. So there are a whole range of things that the college offers specifically for training. But beyond that, the college is there to support the profession, particularly in terms of raising the role of the profession nationally and internationally, and ensuring that the profession has the resources it needs to be able to provide the services it needs to its patients, particularly around things like workforce and so forth. Pathology is a fantastic career. It offers a whole range of opportunities and there's something for everyone. 
At the Royal College of Pathologists, we welcome everyone who is a pathologist and everyone who works in pathology. We are keen to support anyone who is interested in a job in pathology and our trainees are a valuable resource to us in the college. We will work hard with you and to support you and help you develop a great career in pathology. I would like to welcome you today to the trainee day and I look forward to welcoming you in the future. Welcome to pathology. Hi everyone, my name is Jo Brinklow and I'm the Director of Learning at the College. I'm going to do the next talk and then I will be introducing the rest of the speakers as we go on this morning. So let me just share my screen quickly. So as I said, um, I'm the Director of Learning at the College and my remit is um, to look after or oversee all of the um, teams that actually help you and contribute towards your training all the way through. Um, so it's the training, assessment ex and examinations team. Um, I also oversee all of the College's international activity, which has a lot of overlap as well um, with um, promotion of curricula and examinations internationally. Um, so as uh, Professor Osborne said, this is this is your college. Um, this is what the college does. We're a professional membership organisation. We're also a registered charity um, and we deal with all matters relating to pathology um, and support our fellows and affiliates and trainees as they progress through their careers. Um, we're meeting online today, but if you were coming to the college, this is what you'd see. This is our building that we've been in for the last few years, a new building um, and our reception area and towards the back, you can see our fellows and trainees area so if you are ever in London um, you can come in and use the facility uh, on the ground floor of the college it's very comfortable areas there for people to sit and do some quiet work if they want to or, or meet up with colleagues um, just a little bit about what we as a college do for you we do recognize that um, when you first become a specialty trainee, um, there are lots of bodies that are involved in your training and it can sometimes be a bit tricky to work out exactly who does what and who to ask you know, about what. And you can always come and ask the college and if it's not us that can help you, we can always redirect you to, to the right people to speak to. Um, but this, these are the things that are mainly in our remit. So nationally, we have a, a training committee, the Cellular Pathology um, College Specialty Training Committee, which is chaired by Dr. Claire Evans, who you'll be hearing from later. That's made up of all of the training programme directors around the UK um, and we discuss all matters relating to cellular pathology training which includes histopathology but also neuropathology, paediatric pathology and forensic pathology um, and it's that committee or a subgroup of that committee that's responsible for the development of the curriculum and uh, the workplace-based assessments and so on. I've just mentioned the curriculum. We've just been through um, two or three years worth of work updating the curricula and you are only the second cohort of trainees to um, be um, coming on to this curriculum. Um, this everything is available on the website for you to have a look at um, and for you to follow as you go through your training um, and there's lots of guidance on there there's a syllabus as well that that goes along with um, the information that you have also we're responsible for examinations and you know we you'll hear from Dr Sanjeev Manik later who's our clinical director of examinations thankfully you don't have to worry about those just yet but always good to keep those um, information about that um, at the back of your mind as you as you start through through your, your training journey. You'll also be hearing from Michael about our LEP system, which is our ePortfolio. And again, we've just done an awful lot of work to redevelop that so that it maps completely to the new curriculum that you'll be working to. Um, and Michael will walk you through that and show you some of the, the features of that. Um, and while we're not responsible for running the ARCPs, which is your annual review, we do provide guidance because um, the guidance comes from the requirements of the curriculum. So you'll find that there is ARCP guidance on the college website. For the last um, three years or so, we have had derogations in place because of COVID. So it may be um, next spring, we'll, we'll be seeing what happens with that. So it may be that there'll be some revised guidance coming out, but we will let you know about that if that does happen. As Professor Os Osborne also mentioned, our pathology portal went live yesterday. So you came in at just the right time um, to be starting to use this resource, which will be able to support you in your training. 
and the college can provide you with a range of advice and guidance all throughout your training so if you want to work less than full time if you want to you know if you go into research if if you want to train abroad for a period you can always contact the college and get some advice about that and um, what the impact of that might be on your training and, and the team will be able to help you with that and of course when you get to the end of your training and that might seem a long time away at the moment but it's it's not really um, it's, five years will go very quickly um, then it's the college that recommends you for the certificate of completion of training and that's what will get you onto the specialist register to allow you to become a consultant in the UK and as Mike also mentioned we have our trainee advisory committee and again you'll be hearing from Matthew Clark later who's our current chair um, about all of the work that the trainees do um, to to support you all through training um, and myself and the clinical directors meet twice a year with the trainees just to work through um, and discuss any issues um, and those types of things it's a really um, valuable um, way of us being able to make sure that we're keeping on on track with any concerns raised by the trainees the college also has a regional structure um, and as I've mentioned our, we have a close rela working relationship with our training program directors and we also meet regularly with the heads of pathology schools as well and we do provide some external input to deaneries and let, let bees primarily through um, some external representation at your ARCPs. And just quickly, just because I, I do oversee sort of international activity as well, but one of the ways that co uh, the college does support international medical graduates is to support them um, to get GMC registration through either sponsorship or the MTI scheme. So if you are a doctor that has come in through GMC sponsorship and we've supported you, then um, you're also really welcome and it's really nice to see you here today. Um, and as Mike mentioned, there is a huge amount of information um, on the website for trainees. So all of the information that you will need from us is um, is here, helpfully called for trainees who should be able to find it. It's right at the top um, on the, the main bar of the college website. Um, and there's quite a bit of information there which has grown. You can see that we've still got um, some of our COVID-19 information up where it's relevant. Um, and as this page goes down, you'll be able to find other information um, for examinations. There's some webinars that we developed with the Trainee Advisory Committee about um, what, what I wish I'd known from tra senior trainees preparing for the examinations. Um, and also some advice for those that are starting to think about coming to the end of their training and becoming a, a consultant and providing some support for, for new consultants. And then just a little bit more about what else the college does. So I've given you quite a bit of information about the main contact points that you'll have with us when you're a trainee. But once you um, become a fellow of the college, once you've passed your college examination um, and once you're a, a consultant, there are lots of other things that the college does to um, support pathology. And you may have already taken advantage of some of these. We do quite a lot of work to support undergraduates and foundation doctors who are interested in um, pathology as a career. Um, and as Michael also mentioned we do lots of work around workforce surveys gathering evidence about the pathology workforce and then using that to lobby government to advocate for pathology services across the UK where we have identified that there are you know that we need more support more infrastructure those types of things um, there's a CPD portfolio that you'll be able to use when you're a consultant and there are guidelines and data sets and the bulletin which you have access to now as a trainee um, and lots of other things. I, I won't go through the rest of the list of it. You can see conferences and webinars is another thing that you will be able to make immediate, um, have immediate access to. And then just really just to um, delineate some of the responsibilities that we have with some of the other bodies that are involved in your training. So primarily looking at the GMC and then the postgraduate deaneries and LEPIs, um, you can see from this, there's just a very brief overview of our relationship and that the college sort of spans all of the activities around postgraduate training. Um, but we work closely with all of these organisations. And so I'm sure most of you will be familiar with the GMC, you'll be registered with them already. Um, but the college and our, our training uh, and examination activities are uh, regulated by the General Medical Council. Um, so what you see here, these two documents um, set out the expectations that all colleges must meet when they are um, designing new curricula, designing new assessments, designing new examinations. We cannot 
do anything without the GMC giving us the approval um, to say that we have met their standards and those standards are quite exacting too. So um, we, we follow those very closely. Um, with the new curriculum that we introduced last year, we also were required to make sure that we incorporated the generic professional capabilities framework. So every Royal College will have integrated this into their, um, into their curriculum. They are the generic professional capabilities that all doctors, regardless of specialty, must be able to demonstrate. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that, I'm sure, from Claire. But the GMC also have another role, and that is that they also oversee the implementation of the curriculum. So we're, the college is responsible for publishing the curriculum and producing the curriculum, but it's the deaneries and the LEPIs that must make sure that they are implementing those curricula. And the GMC also oversee that activity. Um, and this document outlines the sort of the high level ways in which they go about that. And also just to mention to you that annually the GMC run a national training survey, one for trainees and one for trainers. Um, and those results are published, as you can see, on the GMC website. Very easy to find. Um, and you can have a look at those. And those, uh, the outcomes of um, those surveys, you can have a look at by specialty, by region, by region and specialty, all sorts of things, but really gives a good insight into um, you know, the feedback that we get for all of the specialty medical specialties specialties in the UK um, and it's highly encouraged that everybody participates in that survey when you get the link. And then finally, just a little bit about the deaneries and the let be. So your first four bullet points here are the special the statutory education bodies um, that um, oversee uh, postgraduate medical training in the UK and sitting under Health Education England there are a number of deaneries um, and then Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland are, are also have a deanery infrastructure as well. Um, it's the deaneries, your, your deaneries will be um, the body that gives you your national training number, um, that, that set out your programme, that make sure that they are implementing what we have said is a requirement for your training, um, will give you information about your training rotations, you know, where, where you'll be training, who your educational supervisor will be. They will also set your ARCP dates for you and make those arrangements with you um, to make sure that those are going ahead as well. Um, there is a, sometimes a little bit of overlap and, and the college um, can advise on, on some of these things, but there are some things that the deanery is very very clearly responsible for, such as the running of the ARCP process. Um, but as I've said before, if you're ever not quite sure, you can always ring the college and we will tell you if it's something that we can help you with or we can direct you to the, the right person to speak to. And then finally, just um, an overview um, and, and some really easy email addresses for you to remember. Um, you can contact our team members individually within the college, but um, these are really good and easy email addresses to remember and we'll get to the right people. Um, and I've just tried to give you a very broad outline of um, which team to contact if you've got questions about particular things. So um, if you haven't registered as a trainee with the college already, then um, I am uh, asked to remind you to do that. It's really important that we can get you onto our system and um, make sure that you're sent all of the information you need for training. Um, and then at, that means that then you're brought into everything else that goes in the college as well. So you'll start to receive the bulletin and other updates. There's a, a monthly e-newsletter from the president. Um, you'll get all of those types of things as well. So um, please make sure that you do that as soon as you can if you've not done so already. Um, as I've said, you can also contact the training team for advice about the curriculum, the syllabus, the ARCP guidance, any training advice and you know, finally, at the end, your your CCT application um, and then our assessment team. Um, you can talk to them about the supervised learning events, which is what we now call our workplace based assessments. Those are all on the LEP system as well, which is our e-portfolio and um, the assessment team also have oversight of the pathology portal. And then finally, for the exams, <laughs> it does what it says on the tin. So once you are getting towards thinking about sitting your part one and your part two examinations, then um, you can contact the exams team. But there is, as I say, for all of these departments, lots of information on the website that is readily available for you to access whenever it's convenient for you.
So that's pretty much it from me. Um, and again, uh, welcome. And I hope that this has just been a really helpful overview for you to, to start to understand what the college can do to support you as you start on your training journey. So thank you very much. Thank you, Claire. Jo. Um, <laughs> we'll try and seamlessly move on now. I'm going to give you some overviews or some insights into the uh, histopathology and other cellular pathology curricula. Um, so hopefully this will work. Bear with me a second while we get it full screen. Okay, so <clears throat> again, um, I'd like to reiterate our welcome to you to uh, pathology um, and to our histopathology new trainees welcome day. Um, my name is Claire Evans. I'm a consultant paediatric perinatal pathologist based in Glasgow. And I have a, a couple of roles with the college, the first being the chair of the Cellular Pathology College Specialty Training Committee, which Joe has already indicated is a big committee with the training programme directors across the UK uh, to review uh, training issues, curriculum uh, and other things. Um, I am also chair of the examiner panel for paediatric and perinatal pathology. Um, and I have some training roles up in Scotland. I'm a training program director for paediatric pathology up in Scotland, and I'm also an associate postgraduate dean. Uh, so I, I uh, look after my own program at the moment. Um, just as uh, an aside, <clears throat> uh, each of my slides here has, has a, a different uh, uh, either uh, tissue sample or pathology on it. I'm not going to run this as a slide seminar, but um, uh, just to give you a, a hint of the various things that, that you might come across during your training during the, f the first two and a half years at least. The background to this beginning slide is actually of uh, placenta. So my talk, I am aiming, hopefully, to introduce the curriculum to you and the training pathways in the histopathology specialties in the United Kingdom. Um, I will try my best to familiarize you with some of the terminology because some of this is new. And as Joe has already said, these new curricula were brought in last year. So even the trainers are still uh, learning to get uh, used to all, all the various um, things that we need to do now. Hopefully I'll be able to break down some of the curriculum facets into digestible chunks so you get an idea of where you need to be directing yourself and your learning. Um, I'll indicate where you can find some further information and give a little bit of guidance on um, expectations. This is very general. Obviously, you will have your educational supervisors and your own training program directors within your programs. So talk to them, listen to them, discuss with them, feedback to them as well. Um, the picture in the background here is of an allergen hair. We sometimes get hair samples to look at. So for the in the UK, we have four cellular pathology curricula. Um, all of you, as you are starting out at the moment, will be starting in the first two and a half years of the histopathology curriculum in the part called integrated cellular pathology training. Um, ICPT training as it's called, I'll refer to it as that, has a blend of all the four cellular pathology uh, curricula in it. So it's not just general histopathology, it's also diagnostic neuropathology, pediatric and perinatal pathology, and forensic histopathology. And I'll try and give you a, a flavor as to how these blend together, or hopefully should blend together in the first two and a half years. The training pathways, and they, forgive the bright redness of, of the uh, diagrams here, this is just to hopefully give a kind of graphical impression of how training works through in histopathology. The top red running into the yellow is, is, is what most of you will, will do. You've applied for histopathology. The first two and a half years, you will be in the integrated cellular pathology part of that curriculum. And then once you've um, done your two and a half years, you will move straight into histopathology higher specialist training. And that is run through training. There's no break in that. There's no competitive interview to go into the next stage. It, in theory, you could run through histopathology training in five years, but you do have options to add modules into that 
which will add an, an extra three to six months of training. So I'll come mention those later on. The lower three um, specialties I've indicated below and I've deliberately put a break between the integrated cellular pathology and forensics, peds and, and neuropath because at that point um, there is a competitive interview process and it also means that it, if people are applying from outside of the UK if they have equivalents of training they can apply into these training pathways as well. There is also a slight difference, if you notice down the right hand side, between the training times for the curricula. Um, this is really a, a legacy of the previous curricula that were approved by the GMC. And when the new ones were developed, the General Medical Council were quite insistent that the training times should remain the same. So in total, with a straight through from ICPT into forensics, and completion would be five and a half years, but for diagnostic neuropathology, it would be five and a half to six years. So, as you are all now embarking on integrated cellular pathology training, the first two and a half years should have a combination of histopathology, um, which will also have a proportion of cytopathology and autopsy pathology embedded into it. And you should also have the opportunity to spend time in diagnostic neuropathology, forensic histopathology, and pediatric and perinatal pathology. Um, I would say ideally we would like you to have six weeks in each of the smaller specialties during your uh, first two and a half years of training, but it can vary depending on the training programs um, and regional, there is some regional variation. The first two and a half years of your training, however, it's, it's a, a massive learning curve. Um, if you're coming straight from FY2, um, you will find that a lot of the, the work that you are initially embarking on is learning or revising normal microanatomy, stuff that you may have covered you know, in a little bit during your undergraduate education, but uh, you're certainly, it's, it's core to pathology practice that you are able to determine what is normal from abnormal. So that, that'll be your first port of call is revising all, all normal microanatomy uh, in different circumstances, different age groups. Um, you will spend a lot of time learning pathological processes and applying that to the histology that you see uh, together with molecular pathology, proteomics, uh, for some specialist reporting areas like medical renal biopsies, you will have to be able to interpret electron microscopy and immunofluorescence. So there's, there's more than just looking at a, an H&E slide down a microscope or on a screen. Um, the one thing that has come on leaps and bounds in the past couple of years is the digitization of histological slides. So it, it you, there will be some centers that are almost completely digital and you will re be reporting from day one pretty much off a computer screen. Other places uh, you will have microscopes available and, and there are some centers where you are, will still be reporting straight from glass. Uh, there are advantages and disadvantages to all these things, but you will have to learn to be flexible and adapt to, to where you are training. Uh, during this first two and a half years, you'll also be learning about specimen description and trimming, autopsy practice, you'll be beginning to undertake post-mortem examinations, um, at first heavily supervised and then gradually tailing off as you learn your, improve your knowledge and skills. Um, Clinical pathological correlations, so applying your clinical knowledge that you've got and your background to the patient's pathology that, that you have in front of you. Um, and you will also obviously be expected to complete the assessment process of your training as you go through. So supervised learning events that Joe's mentioned, assessment of performance, which you may not have come across before, um, and multi-source uh, feedback sessions. 
Um, the exams are always on people's minds. When you're coming into specialty training, there are uh, summative hurdles that you will need to clear in order to progress your, with your training. So during the first two and a half years of integrated cellular pathology training, there will be the histopathology part one exam, and that is done online. Um, the, I'm, I'm sure in the talk from uh, Dr. Malik, he will say you should sit the exam when you are ready to sit the exam. Um, and that is very true. I would also recommend to you quite strongly not to delay sitting exams. You should be able to uh, work and pass the part one exam at a roughly about 18 months into training uh, to two years. So that's what you should be aiming for and, and not delaying it further. Um, new, well, new from the point of view of it being embedded in the new curriculum um, is the progressive independent reporting schedule. Um, and I'll show you the document for that uh, shortly. Okay, so what are my training requirements? Where can I find the information that I need? Um, jo in her talk showed you a slide of the training uh, page on the college website. Um, if you go into training by specialty and go down to histopathology 2021, um, you will find the curriculum for training in histopathology. And as Joe has mentioned, this is a GMC approved curriculum um, as the GMC has oversight of training. In addition to the curriculum, which I'll come on to a bit more detail on in a minute, um, all our cellular pathology curricula have associated syllabi with them um, and um, also you'll find there's a document outlining independent reporting for trainees in cellular pathology specialties. Now the syllabus document is important because it gives you an overview, an outline of the kind of pathological specimens and cases you should be covering uh, during each training year. It's not an exhaustive list. And like all um, syllabus documents, these things can go out of date reasonably quickly. Um, so it is a guide. It's not absolute. It's not a your training is not a tick box exercise. Um, but the one thing that it does have in the syllabus documents as well is a guide for expected number of cases for you to see and report in a training year. Again, these are indicative case num numbers. They're not absolute, but they're there to give you a guide of, of the, the amount of work you should be able to get through. Um, balancing the learning needs that you have certainly in the early stages of your pathology training. Training pathways, the, obviously the um, arrow um, diagram that I showed you a couple of slide back, slides back gives you an idea of training, but this is really where we are at here um, with cellular pathology in, in the UK. So you're all here, cellular pathology integrated, um, sorry, histopathology integrated cellular pathology training. The majority of you are going to carry on straight away after two and a half years into higher specialist training. Um, we're, we're just straight through, you will be in the same training program, you will keep your same national training number, there, there will be nothing for you to, to worry about as far as that is concerned. Others of you may have a specialist interest, some of you may already have that specialist interest brewing in the background of things that you're interested in. So in neuropathology, pediatrics and perinatal or forensics. Um, and for this, you, you would apply at around two years in order to start at two and, at two and a half years um, after integrated cellular pathology training at the earliest. Um, and to get successfully into these training programs from ICPT, you have to have passed your part one examination. Um, for these, as these are separate histopathology curricula, sorry, cellular pathology curricula, they will come with a separate national training number. So you will actually rescind your, your initial training number and get a new one to come into these specialties which may or may not be in the same training region that you are already in. It depends where you apply for. So 
The histopathology higher specialist training is of course will be run through after ICPT and technically is two and a half years long. And during that time, you will be expected to clear the part two examination hurdle. Um, you do have options to do the certificate of higher autopsy training or the certificate of higher cervical cytology training at the moment. Um, really, your, your training program directors and heads of school will want to know quite early on if you wish to pursue these certificates. Um, even if you're doing them later on in training, so that they can get things organized um, for your training rotations to make sure that you have adequate experience in order to pass the, the uh, hurdles that go with these two certificates as well. Um, so it's something you, you need to consider quite early. I would definitely advise if you're staying in histopath run through training in order to keep your job options later on as wide as possible, as open as you wish. Um, the certificate of higher autopsy training is a very useful thing to have um, and um, it, it, it will give you greater options when you finish. For specialty training in neuropathology, forensics, or perinatal pathology, I've already mentioned that we apply to these programs any time following on from uh, integrated cellular pathology training. Um, if uh, when coming through from ICPT, make sure part one is well out of the way, um, and then uh, you just carry straight on into your new training program. The structure of the curricula for um, the cellular pathology specialties is very similar. And if you have a look at the documents, they, they're all set out in, in the same way. It's just that the contents um, will be nuanced for the various specialties. Um, all the specialties, uh, neuropath, peds and forensics have their own part two examinations. Um, and when, once you've completed training, you'll come out with a specific uh, completion um, uh, of no, um, a certificate of completion of training certificate um, at the end of it. Um, and you'll go to the specialist register under that specialist CCT. So <clears throat> what's in a curriculum? The curriculum for the cellular pathology specialties are basically designed to give you a broad coverage of the facets of learning and practice um, that you need. And they are revisited every year. Um, these have been um, drawn down, as Joe said, from the GMC Capabilities in Practice um, guidance from the General Medical Council. And um, we have specific capabilities in practice for you to follow each year. Um, the learning requirements each year, we're thinking of a, a kind of spiraling of the curriculum, so starting off um, more basic, becoming gradually more complex and nuanced as you become more senior, and you revisit areas in, in the curriculum each year to develop on your previous learning. The idea of the curriculum is to give you all that you should need to know um, and be able to do to reach a standard of work um, that will allow you to work as an independent practitioner, i.e. a consultant. Um, the curriculum itself defines specific training hurdles um, and, it, and it gives you a framework for the portfolio of documentation and evidencing learning and practice. You need to use a combination of the curriculum document together with the syllabus, independent reporting um, and assessment strategies. All these documents are on the college website in the training section. Um, as Jo has said in, in her talk, kind of delineating the remit of the college versus the deanery. Um, your local deanery is responsible for the delivery of your training and it's responsible for ensuring the delivery standards and assessing your progress. So your ARCPs are run through the deanery, but the results of those ARCPs are sent through to the college. So capabilities in practice. These are the 11 facets, if you like, of practice that are defined in the curriculum 
that um, you will need to work around and develop as part of your training. And I will come to how we break this down even further. So there are 11 capabilities of, uh, in practice in the curriculum, starting with the ability to effectively function in the healthcare system um, and other organization and management systems to deliver high quality patient care. We have ethical and legal frameworks to consider with our practice. Um, if you think of um, Mike Osborne's speech when, at the beginning, when he's talking about working with um, other agencies outside of medicine, as well as your clinical colleagues, you have to think of working with police, military, etc. We, we've got that, as well as thinking about the law as it stands in the uh, in the, in the um, areas of the UK, I say the countries of the UK. So the Human Tissue Act, um, coroner system, the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service up in Scotland, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. Importantly, communication is really very central to how we um, behave. We are not uh, people who sit in an office uh, or in the basement of, of the hospital with the lights out, just staring into the tubes of our microscope, just coming out now and again, uh, like bats in the evening. So all of our work requires us to be able to communicate with our clinical colleagues, our pathology colleagues, our colleagues in the laboratory, uh, our colleagues in the uh, mortuary and external colleagues, police, lawyers, uh, educationalists, all sorts of people. Um, so you have to be able to, to work in that situation. You need to be aware of what's going on. And this is part of learning skills on prioritization and being effective with your own work. Um, patient safety, of course, is at the center of what we do. Um, as as um, others have mentioned, research is very important. Education is extremely important um, and it's not just the formal stuff, it's the informal stuff and at your stage of training, you know, you are in a, in a prime position to be able to contribute to undergraduate education as you develop your um, knowledge of pathology and how to apply things. Um, Importantly as well, and this is lifelong, um, able to self-appraise, learn and adapt. Um, I've been a consultant for, for many years now, and I don't think that a week goes by when there isn't something that I've learned or, or, or had to adapt to. So this is extremely important. Leadership and management um, is, is important as well. You need to be able to work within the organization that, that you are in, and you also need to be able to assess and appraise how it's working and help develop things that will um, make the patient journey better, also make the pathology journey better. Um, so this is all very important. You need to learn about um, error reporting, um, how laboratories are regulated and managed and quality controlled, all that kind of thing. Um, so we've got lots of things. And of course, one number 11 here off to the side, which I hope isn't obscured by um, uh, the mugshots um, from the webinar, but able to manage, handle and interpret pathological specimens accurately and safely mindful of the risk to self and others. I think that's probably our, our, our central one here. And I apologize, it's off, off to, to, the, to the right here. Um, as part of your practice as well with histopathology specimens, it's not just looking at an H&E down the microscope. Uh, that, of course, is, is a core uh, skill, but also now in the, in the age of um, personalized medicine and the ability to uh, learn about and use molecular pathology techniques and other techniques for the diagnosis, investigation and management of patients uh, is extremely important. There are lots of other things. This is quite a busy slide as well, but again, I hope that it gives you an idea of the kind of things that are part of training and part of the curriculum here and the things that you, some of this, or quite a lot of this, you will just be doing without realizing. 
Um, this diagram, if you like, just puts it into a more formal um, visual um, graphic so that you could you get an understanding of, of the kind of things that we are looking for the, and the curriculum demands of you. Um, things that we haven't mentioned, report writing and diagnostic coding. Why might we be diagnostic coding? Why, why at the end of each pathology report do we give it um, a, a disease code, a tissue code? Um, you know, think about auditing, review, research, that kind of thing. Being responsible for your learning and maintaining your portfolio. This is very important. <clears throat> and as a, an educational supervisor, TPD, et cetera, uh, one of my bugbears uh, are people who, who leave getting all their uh, workplace based assessments or supervised learning events done at the last minute before uh, their ARC P submission is due. That's not how this is supposed to work. As part of your training, your supervised learning events, whether they be uh, directly observed procedures or case based discussions, are to be done as you go through, just demonstrate that you are learning and going along and you're following that spiral of the curriculum, going from the, the kind of easier stuff through to the more complex nuanced things. Um, they, just having someone sign something off and not discuss a case with you and you not discussing the case with your clinical or educational supervisor or supervising consultant is not going to help you learn. Learning is an active process and it requires feedback between you and your, and your trainer. So please keep this up, up to date and keep it on track. In the curriculum document itself, all the cellular pathology curricula have learning maps. And this is where we come back to the capabilities in practice. So there are 11 capabilities in practice and each one of these is broken down into a separate descriptor. And I think if I remember off the top of my head, there are 50 descriptors, roughly speaking. And each of these descriptors has then been broken down into training years, roughly. This is actually one to 12 months, for example. So this is, is uh, capability in practice 11. So able to take, manage and interpret pathological specimens accurately and safely, mindful of the risk to self and others. So in the first 12 months, we want to see that you've got a safe structured approach to the surgical cut up. You can do, identify and describe anatomy, relevant features and sample appropriately so that you can extract what you need to see down the microscope. So starting from that and then it, it becomes more complex as you have as you get more experience. Some of you will follow this per year. Some will, will go up or down. It, it's very individual. Um, the one thing about assessing your performance with your educational clinical supervisor is you that you can use this learning map to identify where you think you are per, in these um, capability and practice descriptors where your supervisor thinks you are or where you feel you need more uh, to gain more confidence and more experience. And you can work and use the map to guide your training through the training years. Um, that's the that's the point of this map. It's, it's to guide you to make sure that you, you can be on track for your learning so that you're hitting your summative hurdles at the right level at the right time. This is the same capability in practice, but it's for the histopathology higher specialist training. So months 31 to 36 and then all the way up to year five. So 49 to 60. So the kind of ma management of macroscopic description has gone all the way to demonstrates growth compared to previous year in preparation for independent practice. You've got increasing confidence in dissecting specimens. Um, Many of you will, will grasp uh, specimen dissection very early on. It is also up to you to develop insight, to know where you are comfortable and where you know the things that you do know and where you are unsure and when you need to ask for help and supervision. Um, you, you should be in a situation where you can ask a supervisor at any point to help you if they're not directly overseeing you for these things. 
More simply, for the capabilities in practice and learning map, we have 11 capabilities in practice, 50 capabilities in practice descriptors, and then the learning map broadens it out to six descriptors per training year. So it shows you kind of a, a pyramid um, style um, for, for your learning. As well as the capabilities in practice in the uh, new curriculum, there are entrustable professional activities. And I've nicked this uh, graphic off uh, Google because um, Miller's uh, pyramid is quite um, well known in, in educational um, literature. But this just gives you an idea of the, how the curriculum is actually built from first principles of uh, knows, knows how, shows and does and the knowledge, skills and attitudes. So the curriculum, although we don't necessarily use knowledge, skills and attitudes in, in some of the literature now, um, this basically gives you an idea of how we run the curriculum and the training through that and how you develop um, with time through your training. So using that process or theory of Miller's uh, pyramid, we have the levels of entrustment. So these are basically levels um, that you and your supervisor can work through again, um, looking at assessment of performance or your SLEs to decide where you are um, per training year. Now in the curriculum document, Appendix C, we've got histopathology and trustment levels. Level one would be where you're starting from. So you're entrusted to observe only, no provision of clinical care, through to level four, where you're entrusted to act unsupervised. And you can see in the table here, ICPT year one, Many of these are observation. And then as you progress through your training years, you, you're expected to be able to progress further towards independent practice. So the entrustment levels cover all activities. It's not just independent reporting. It will be uh, specimen dissection. It will be writing reports. It will even be writing referral letters. Uh, it might it would be um, helping the laboratory with um, uh, controls, internal quality assessment, all that kind of thing. Um, Post-mortems from watching to learning and doing to eventually to be able to do the whole thing independently yourself. Um, so this, again, gives you an idea of our expectations for your training. So how are you going to achieve the curriculum requirements? This again is, um, I've taken a, a snapshot from the curriculum document and in here it describes uh, learning experience where you might derive your learning material from. Top of the list is routine work and I cannot emphasize enough that getting your eyes on as many cases as you can without swamping yourself is the most important thing through your training. You really need it to see a critical mass of cases to be confident and competent. And it's that critical mass of work um, and learning and seeing cases that will get you through the summative hurdles, particularly the part two examination. Um, there are many ways that you can learn. We've got textbooks, we've got private study, black box sessions. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with black box, uh, it, it used to be um, literally a box with a set of slides in and you'd be given a set of histories and uh, one of the consultants would come and take you through those once you'd had a look at the cases. So you would work through what you think the diagnosis is, what, what do you think would happen to the patient, et cetera, et cetera. And then the, the, the trainer would actually take you through those cases. Um, some of the, some departments still run these glass back, black box sessions. Some of them are doing them digitally. Um, we also have training courses. The RCPAP has courses. Um, we, there are for histopathology some uh, part two exam courses, but 
please don't rely on those just to get you through the exam. Routine work and seeing lots of cases in addition to all your learning will get you through exams. Um, Multidisciplinary team meetings are very useful for your clinical pathological correlation and you learn quite quickly how, how you write a report, what you put in a report is interpreted by your clinical colleagues and how it has an impact on clinical practice and decision making, particularly oncology MDTs, renal MDTs, all that kind of thing. It, you, you have to learn all the various nuances for report writing uh, and how you get the message across in a way that your clinical colleagues can understand you. Um, for some, uh, you, you will need attachment to specialist departments and this may apply for people developing specific specialist interests and also will happen for those in the smaller cellular pathology specialties. Um, if your department doesn't cover everything the curriculum requires, then specialist attachments elsewhere uh, will help with that. And I haven't got it on here because it's not in the um, curriculum document because it was published before. But of course, Pathology Portal, we've got um, online e-learning, but um, our, one of our previous presidents, uh, Joe Martin, will be speaking about the Pathology Portal. Finally, this is my um, last slide for you, the assessment strategy document. I've not gone into details on the individual um, supervised learning events. Um, this document, which is on the training section of the website, does detail what is um, what the college has for um, assessment with regard to the formative side of things, so direct observed procedures, case-based discussions, evaluation of clinical events, um, and the assessment of performance documents that, that come in, how many MSFs you'd be required to do, uh, plus the examinations. Now, for the cellular pathology specialties, it's quite straightforward from the point of view of numbers of assessments. It's six of the uh, DOP, CBDs, X and AOPs each year. That's it. So um, 24 per year, all through training. Um, you need to do three MSFs at different points through your training. And of course, you've got the exams. So here is the web address for the assessment strategy uh, document. So Please ask questions in the Q&A section of the webinar if there are things that you'd like explained in more detail or if I've just confused everyone completely, please let me know. But I hope that that gives you a basic overview of the curriculum. Thank you, Claire. That was really helpful. Thank you. Um, so as Claire said, just a reminder, please keep putting your um, questions in the Q&A box and we'll be picking all of those up at the end so you can put those in at any time um, and next on the agenda we have have Michael Gillett from the assessment department who's going to give you an introduction to the LEP system so over to you Michael. Hi everyone uh, my name is Michael Gillett uh, I'm the assessment administrator at the college um, one of my roles is uh, to be responsible for all trainee queries regarding the LEP system. And I'm going to share my screen now and give you a quick demonstration. OK, so uh, we'll start here. Uh, let me just give you a little bit of background first uh, before we start. Um, the LEP system is the e-portfolio that trainees will use uh, to record their progress throughout each training year. Um, it's used for recording your workplace-based assessments, uh, including your multi-source feedback assessments, uh, known as MSFs. Uh, the system has a functionality to support the annual review of competence progression process, and it also provides the Educational Supervisors Structured Report, uh, known as the ESSR. Uh, which is the document giving the snapshot of uh, a trainee's year of training. Um, you um, will be the second uh, year of trainees to join the new LEP system. 
Um, and so, yeah, uh, to log in, uh, you'll need to go to the rcpath.org website uh, and just click in to the new LEP system. Um, you will see the new let uh, the members login where you will need to put in your registered email address along with your college password. Uh, those of you that have already registered uh, should uh, have already had an email asking you to do this. Uh, those that have not yet registered, um, you will uh, get an email to set your password up uh, following this. If you click uh, login. OK, uh, and then on this page, it will just show you the type of access that you have to the LEP system. And for each of you uh, during your first year of training, it will just say trainee. If you click continue to access the platform. Uh, for the first time that you access the platform, another page will appear here uh, asking you to select your educational supervisor uh, and your training program director. Um, and without doing uh, these two in particular, you won't be able to go any further uh, on the MET system. Um, so, yeah, and when you um, select those two, uh, you'll be taken to this page, which is the home page. Um, let me just tell you now, uh, there will be some instructional videos uh, coming out on uh, how to use the different aspects of the LEP system. They'll be available this autumn for you. Um, and until then, uh, Joe showed you our email earlier and I'll show you another way uh, to get in contact with us later on in the demo, um, but just contact us anytime. Uh, we're always really happy to help you. Um, so uh, I'll just walk you through the home page here. So at the top, you've got the blue bar, which is the navigation menu. Uh, this release tab is uh, a place where you can change your relationships. Uh, down here, you can also do that just by clicking into the educational supervisor's name. If you need to change them at any point, you can use the drop down menu here uh, to change your educational supervisor or TPD. Um, the alert section will show any let alerts such as downtime uh, when we're having a, a new system update. The uh, let system will go down for an hour or so and that notification will just show there for you. Uh, there's the tasks menu here and any items that require your attention uh, will be shown here under tasks. And uh, the let system also allows messages uh, and correspondence uh, to be sent between let users. This down here is the training card. Uh, which will list your year of training, your ARCP date, uh, which I'll talk to you a little bit more about uh, further on in the demo, uh, your educational supervisor's structured report, uh, and then as shown earlier, the relationships uh, for this dummy record. Uh, these are all names of people from the college for the purpose of this demo. And down here, uh, you have the progress bar. Um, as Claire showed you in the last talk, uh, you have your addictive numbers of each type of workplace based assessment that you need to complete. And uh, once you've uh, created your ARCP, which I'll show you uh, in a minute how to do, um, and you can associate your assessments to it and you can see how you're doing down here. So as you can see, this dummy record has done two out of six of its case based discussions and so on. Uh, so firstly, from this navigation menu, I'm going to hover my mouse over the three horizontal bars, which are also known as the burger menu. I'm going to click into profile. Um, so here are your profile details at the top. Um, as the college is a single sign on system, uh, you can only change your email address by notifying us uh, or changing it yourself by the college website. Uh, the new LEP system will be uh, updated the following day, uh, the following working day, once you've done that on the college website. Uh, and do note here, you can also upload a photo. And as you are informed down here, everyone with access to your profile uh, will be able to see your photo. 
And down here under uh, portfolio user details, uh, you can see the anticipated completion date, uh, which will be auto populated along with your year of training. And here you can enter your job position, such as SD1 trainee and your workplace. Uh, the NTN number is a mandatory field for your ESSR, uh, your Educational Supervisor Structured Report. And uh, you will need to enter these details here when you receive it from your uh, deanery or let be admin staff. Uh, one thing I uh, should have shown you on the home page and just go back to um, your ARCP external representatives. Uh, you won't need to select them straight away, uh, but the deanery and let the admin staff will inform you of them uh, during the year. So once you do know those names, you can give them access here. So one of the first things to do on your LEP system will be to create your ARCP, uh, which is your annual review of competence progression. Uh, so I'm going to hop on my mouse over ARCPs and click into create and list. As you can see, here's one we made earlier. But to uh, just click uh, to create a new one, just click into create. Uh, and your ARCP date, uh, you will be informed uh, by your deanery what this will be. Um, but just for now, to set the ARCP up, um, we say you can just enter a fictitious date uh, until you find out the exact date. Uh, these uh, ARCP meetings are normally around May. Uh, so just for now, I will put in May 2023, oh, the 9th. These dates here are the from and to dates for your ARCP. Now, these just cover the training year. So make sure when you put the to date in, uh, you don't do it to your ARCP date. This uh, date will cover the end of the training year. Uh, so for now, I will do this as the 1st of August until the end of, oh, I beg your pardon, until the end of July next year to cover this whole training year. And then any additional details that you wish to let your uh, educational supervisor or ARCP external representatives, uh, if you want to let them know any extra details, you can put them down here. This could just be uh, information as to what might have impacted uh, these dates up here. Um, so yeah, you can enter them there. And once that's done, you can press save. Um, just for the purpose of this demonstration, I'm just going to back out of this one. Now, one of the most uh, important sections of the LEP system is the assessment section up here, uh, where you record all of your workplace-based assessments. So I'm going to hover over assessments and click create and list. Um, and do know, of course, um, I know you're being bombarded with lots of information today. Um, if not, if some of this doesn't stick and you do need to ask questions about what I've shown you, uh, again, of course, there's a chat function today. But of course, you can reach out to us on our email uh, assessment at rcpath.org. Uh, so to create a assessment, uh, you click into create. And I do note, um, as Claire showed you in the last um, talk, the you will complete free MSFs during your training. However, during the first year, the college will initiate this for you. So you will not see the option down here to set your MSFs up. Uh, the college will do this. Uh, and this normally happens around February time. And the whole process will last until April for you to receive your feedback. Um, but to create a workplace-based assessment, uh, you'll have the list of assessors here. As you build up assessors, uh, they will already appear in this list. Um, but if their name is not there when you first start, which will, will likely be the case, uh, you can just select other, find. And then once you've selected the type of assessment, I'll do um, an ECE for now. Uh, you can click into create assessment and you'll come up. Uh, you'll, you'll see a list uh, of all the assessors that you can choose if your assessor is not in that list you can add them as a guest assessor uh, and then you'll be able to just put their title and, and, and name and email address in there to send the assessment to them uh, just for the purpose of this video i'll set myself as the assessor and as i've already selected ece and i'll click into create assessment i'll just show you what the assessment 
page looks like for the ECE. The um, each workplace based assessment looks roughly the same as this, but there are uh, just different uh, fields to fill out as you go down. So the top part is already pre-populated, but you can change the date as appropriate. And then each of these fields with the red asterisks are mandatory fields uh, for you to fill out as you go down. And then if you fill out each one of these, you'll get down to the assessor um, feedback part. Uh, now you can enter information here as the trainee. Uh, for instance, you may have already had a discussion with your assessor about this and you may wish to add comments, but do note these sections can be overwritten uh, by the assessor on their review and, and they get um, overriding say on, on what's put in these. Uh, and then once you're done, you can submit to the assessor or of course you can save it as a draft as many times as possible uh, and reaccess it on your tasks menu and on the assessment page. Um, once you have completed it and you're submitted to your assessor, they will of course uh, approve or return it to you for modifications. Uh, once they've approved it, you will have to associate it with the capabilities in practice that, uh, I beg your pardon, I'll just go back to the homepage, that Claire showed you earlier. Um, I have set one up here, uh, an ECE which uh, has been approved by the assessor, and you can just click into associate with capabilities in practice and generic just capabilities, um, sorry, generic professional capabilities. Uh, here, you will just choose the relevant SIPs capabilities in practice. And you'll see down here that the, uh, the generic professional capabilities, GPCs, uh, will also populate, but you can, of course, change this uh, as you feel necessary. And then once you've pressed add, and the last thing to do is to associate the completed assessment with your ARCP. Uh, it's already got the most recent ARCP in here. Of course, you'll only have one during your first year of training. And you can assign it. And then when you go back to your homepage, the ECE will be showing uh, down here. Uh, so you'll have uh, another ECE completed. Um, okay, uh, the next section, um, oh, and do, do know all the assessments work on this basis. So whatever type of workplace-based assessment you choose, uh, whether it's the ECE, the, the case-based discussion, etc., cetera, uh, you'll complete the fields. It will go to the assessor, they'll approve or return it. And then once it's been approved, you associate it with the capabilities in practice and assign it to your ARCP. Um, I'll just very quickly show you the other parts of LEPT. Of course, um, you know, there'll be videos uh, coming out in the autumn that will go into these in a bit more depth and we're always here to uh, assist you on, on anything. But under training development, uh, you can create and list your personal activities. Uh, your personal activities can actually include uh, today's welcome day. You can add that uh, on there as a training activity and these will all populate the educational supervisor's structured report when it's created at the end of the year. Uh, the training rotations, um, these are where you can record any rotations that you might have, for instance if you go on for a, a rotation at a different hospital for a couple of weeks, uh, you can record that here. Uh, and keep this up to date because this will also populate your educational supervisor's structured report, uh, which I will show you how to set up uh, in a second. And uh, lastly, uh, there's resources up here. Uh, this is for things uh, such as documents like the um, examination letters that you might want to see your ARCP panel to uh, view. Um, and uh, these can also contain documents that might uh, go into discussions that you've had with your educational supervisor. And then just quickly um, to create your educational supervisor's structured report, which you do um, every year, um, you'll go into the ARCP that you already would have set up, click on progress. And if you edit, I beg your pardon, sorry, I'll come out of that. Sorry, let me start again, I do beg your pardon. 
it might be actually that this dummy record already has the ECE set up for it actually uh, the ESSR set up for it which is why I can't uh, set up an ESSR now but um, it is quite simple to do you just do it from that ARCP's page click into the ARCP and um, you'll have the option to create an ESSR uh, so in a nutshell uh, that is how to use the ePortfolio but as I said before there'll be some videos during the autumn uh, to help you further and the assessment department is always available to help um, the other way you can submit a query to us, um, you can obviously, of course, email assessment at rcpath.org, or you can go down to the report issue under help, uh, where you just type the details of your issue and that will come through to the assessment uh, department straight away for us to uh, deal with. Um, so that is the end of the demonstration. Um, and of course, please do use the chat function. Uh, to ask any lecture related questions that you might have today and um, we will answer them later on. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Michael. That was um, a really good initial run through of um, everything. So, and as Michael said, there'll be lots of other guidance forthcoming um, during the autumn as well to help you more. Um, our next talk is from Dr. Sanjeev Manik, who's the Clinical Director of Examinations. Um, he couldn't join us live today, so just to let you know that this is a pre-recorded uh, video that we're going to be showing you now. But if you do have questions, please continue to put them um, in the Q&A. Um, we will probably be able to answer most of them, but anything that we can't answer, we will, um, we're will. we going to make all the Q&As available on the website um, after the event anyway, so you'll be able to see it there. So, uh, Louis, can you start the video for us, please? I'm the Clinical Director of Examinations, probably the last person you wanted to hear from uh, on, on your welcoming day. Uh, but um, as uh, Professor Osborne uh, uh, just mentioned, that um, uh, we, we, there are lots of roles uh, for the college to fulfill uh, for trainees and uh, for consultants. And one of the most important ones um, is, is examinations because um, uh, that's one sort of measure, of objective measure of um, how your training um, uh, takes place and, and helps you to get to the point where you can uh, report independently and become a successful pathologist. So what I intend to do today is to give you an overview of examinations, uh, no specific details, but just for you to keep this in mind um, and as has already been mentioned, uh, lots of information is available uh, on, on the websites, which I'll, I'll refer to again in a, in a moment. Okay, so um, the college provides a lot of information on curricula by specialty and information on examinations by specialty. And this is regularly updated as um, things change or new information is, is gathered. Um, and we, we provide the up-to-date information um, because we, we obtain this from various sources. So we work very closely with the GMC uh, who, who are in charge of approving curricula, but also um, uh, examination formats and delivery uh, of examinations. Uh, we as a college have to also work very closely with other Royal Colleges. Uh, so there's an Academy uh, of Medical Royal Colleges. So we um, have lots of meetings with them, especially uh, where exams are, are concerned. Um, we get, gather our information from all of you via the Trainee Advisory Committee. And quite often we do put out surveys uh, to gather information from all of you and also from the uh, consultant workforce um, in case we need to um, look at potential changes to uh, exams content and, and format of delivery. So all these, uh, as and when this happen, uh, are updated uh, on the website and um, most often by specialty, although there are many generic things that are also put out there. So as a college, we not only um, provide examinations in terms of actually uh, forming the exams, but we also standard set them and we quality assure them so uh, we can then uh, give reassurance to bodies like the GMC that uh, these exams are fit for purpose and they are regularly um, quality assured 
um, just to make sure that um, they do provide the kind of assessment that is required to fulfill some of the GMC requirements. Um, we also provide feedback to trainees. So uh, this is uh, specific exam related feedback to trainees who may not have succeeded at certain parts of the exams, just in, uh, so that they can uh, be helped um, when they reattempt uh, examinations. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. Um, one thing to say is that the exams are of very high standard and uh, have international recognition to the point that um, many of our candidates uh, do come from abroad. Uh, and because many of the exams now uh, also take place online, uh, we have a large contingent of uh, candidates that um, are international. Um, and we are also beginning to uh, administer the exams uh, uh, internationally, uh, where it is uh, feasible and possible so that um, uh, we can facilitate exam delivery for candidates who may find it difficult to travel um, to United Kingdom. So as Dr. Osborne already mentioned, we uh, are responsible for 17 different specialties and as a result, not only for the training aspects of them, but also for the assessment and examinations uh, aspects as well. So we are able to provide examinations for all the specialties at different parts uh, as required. So the, the medical only type specialties um, are uh, hematology, histopathology, and then um, the more specialized areas within that um, would be forensic pathology, neuropath, PED path, uh, autopsy and cervical cytology. So we would have exams for all of these as well. And then there are some smaller specialties or super specialties uh, where uh, we have fewer candidates uh, on each sitting session, but uh, we will ensure that exams are provided as and when uh, they need to be provided. And then there are some specialties where we also do uh, cater for clinical scientists who are working towards becoming consultant clinical scientists and the exams that they have to do. And many times the exams are similar to the medical um, uh, workforce, but also some of them are geared towards um, their specialty um, so that they can become important members of uh, pathology teams around the country. So clinical biochemistry, genetics, medical microbiology, virology, immunology uh, fall under that sort of um, domain. And then there are certain other ones where it's more based uh, around clinical scientists um, uh, and we are responsible for their examinations and we would have to work closely with the organizations that um, uh, actually formulate their training, uh, but rely on the RC path to provide the examinations for them. So basically, where does examinations fit um, in, in any one specific curriculum? Um, it's, it has to go hand in hand with um, what's often termed as workplace-based assessments or any other types of assessments that take place regularly. And the examinations are designed such that they happen at certain points in training just to make sure that um, sufficient knowledge has been obtained as well as sufficient skills. So they, they're not exclusive um, to uh, progression in training, uh, but they, have, they are very important parts uh, of the training and um, always have to be taken together with other forms of assessment. So if we, you will have seen this uh, Miller's Pyramid uh, many times, and if not, you will see that from time to time. Uh, basically, um, you know, we, we are trying to sort of go from bottom to top. So gathering knowledge, um, then understanding this knowledge and, and trying to apply it um, and, and do it in such a way that you can show the competence for it. Um, and then actually, uh, as you reach the end of your training or towards the end of your training, you can actually show the performance of what you have gathered uh, during the years of training. So, um, 
in very simple terms, the, the part one exam uh, is to test your knowledge basically. So that comes fairly early uh, in your training. And then the part two covers the sort of understanding and competence aspects of it. So you not only show that um, you know, but you, you also show how uh, you apply that knowledge. And then finally, as I said, as it goes in hand in hand with other forms of assessment, um, you can reach the top of the pyramid in that aspect. So we do have a, uh, in, in most specialties a, a period of um, residual training after the part two exam, uh, which, which is by no means an exit exam, uh, so that um, the remaining training consolidates uh, the uh, previous training, but also can focus on areas which uh, need to be covered. Uh, and sometimes that information is available from the performance in, in the part two examination. So if you take cellular pathology, for instance, uh, the part one uh, is, is the first uh, milestone to, to cover. And then after a couple of more years of training, part two, um, and then there are uh, additional modules that people can um, can enter and, and take uh, if they want to subspecialize a little bit more in autopsy. So then we provide a certificate examination for that. Um, and also, uh, although it's a uh, um, small science now, the cervical cytopathology, we still are able to provide examinations for those who want to uh, take that up as, as a future career. So another certificate exam. And then the part two examinations can also be um, slanted towards the specialties that have their own CCT, like neuropath, peat path, and, and forensic pathology. And uh, those who want to specialize in dermatopathology, after having done the part one and part two FRC path, can also then do further training in, in that area. And um, we provide a diploma exam for that. Uh, similar overarching structure for other specialties, like for instance, part one and part two in clinical biochemistry, uh, which is to be combined with the metabolic medicine in due course um, and uh, in infection training as well. So um, we have a part one exam in FRC path in infection training, which um, um, for the medical people who want to do microbiology and biology, then go on to take the part two in that uh, or after obtaining the what we call the CICE certification um, can progress on to infectious diseases. So we are also responsible for providing the um, combined infection certificate examination as well. And something like that would um, require us to work very closely with the Royal College of uh, Physicians um, and other colleges. So just a broad overview of what the part one exam is. Generally, it's a, it's, it's a written uh, examination in terms of uh, MCQs, and that's the re one of the reasons why we are able to provide it uh, online. Um, and that's something that um, we managed to achieve during uh, 2020 uh, when um, things were changing very fast as far as exam delivery were concerned. Um, so the idea is to sort of keep to the online uh, delivery format. Um, and so these uh, are basically MCQs in CAMPATH uh, and histopathology or, uh, or cellular pathology. Uh, we have a combination of MCQs and, and EMQs. Um, and uh, in combined infection training, we have um, MCQ and, and short um, single best answer type papers as well. And, and using MCQs gives us a, a chance to test uh, broad uh, knowledge and in-depth knowledge at the same time. So we do provide sample questions um, and, and limited amounts of past papers. Um, and as I said, you can uh, look at um, your specialty um, and, and see what, what's up there uh, for your specialty to, to guide you. A lot of times uh, we are asked as to when to sit the part one. Um, and, and I would say as a, as a generic comment that um, it's important that you do this when you feel that you are ready for it or your education supervisor does. And, and, and I always uh, tend to say that no need to rush into examinations just because you think you know, a milestone has to be covered. 
um, it's, it's more important that you are prepared for this examination so that you have every chance of succeeding in the first attempt. So normally uh, the part one, because it's testing knowledge is, is around sort of one and a half to two and a half years. So for instance, in, in cellular pathology uh, with, uh, with the on incoming new curriculum, um, it is regarded that perhaps at about 13 months, one can consider um, taking the part one examination. And then what is the past standard? Um, so we, we were obviously wanting to see if the trainees have reached a level of knowledge and understanding expected at around two years into the program. Um, and w once we can see that the candidates possess that kind of knowledge, um, uh, you know, they, they pass and then they progress to higher stages of training uh, where they consolidate the knowledge parts and now uh, sort of focus on applying that knowledge. And how do we determine the past standard? Um, there are many methods available, but generally we tend to use the ANGOF method for the part one especially. And although we don't have as many examiners as these sitting in any one session, it feels very much like that in that uh, every single question is scrutinized um, and assessed, uh, not only for its reliability, uh, but for its uh, testing uh, capability as well. And we um, do this independently amongst the examinations, um, examiners to see how well a candidate might perform on any one um, a question. So we then um, have a range of opinions from a range of uh, examiners and all that's put together in a uh, statistical fashion that uh, will not only give us a pass mark for each question, but then for the whole exam uh, in, um, in, in total. So we, we have to do this at every uh, occasion that when a new paper is set. Moving on to part two, basically, as I said, you, you're not only uh, testing the application of knowledge, but also demonstrating uh, a certain degree of skills as well, depending on what specialty uh, you're in. Um, and, and the exams are designed to test um, these aspects of your training. Uh, the pass one pass rates um, generally don't fluctuate too much, but it does obviously depend on, on cohorts in, in the training um, and also the number of people, uh, candidates entering, say, from the international uh, side of things as well. So um, there is a bit of a variation, but generally what I'm showing here uh, are sort of 2019 figures where um, we have sort of more data because last year many things were slightly skewed. Uh, although, as, you know, interestingly and surprisingly, the pass rates did not deviate uh, too much uh, from this. Uh, but for instance, if I take histopathology, which is my area, the, the part one pass rate is in the sort of seven, early 70%. Um, so that's the kind of thing um, we see from year to year. Part two, because it's testing uh, more in the way of uh, skills and, uh, and application of knowledge, uh, you do tend to see lower pass rates in these and these can fluctuate and there is quite often uh, a wide range. Uh, but what I'm showing you here are the average uh, pass rates over the past few years. I did mention uh, feedback. And what's very important to understand here is that whenever a candidate uh, is unsuccessful in any part uh, of the examination, uh, the idea of providing as detailed feedback as possible is to uh, help with future learning. So it provides a uh, summary of the performance. Uh, it's not necessarily a guidance uh, on the steps required to pass at the next attempt. Uh, what it does do is it, it shows the, uh, the candidates where they uh, were not quite up to standard or um, were a little bit suboptimal. And, and quite often it might be just one or two areas that they need to focus on. So when we provide this kind of detailed feedback, they know where to focus on for the second attempt. So it should not be used uh, as, as a sole uh, basis for preparing for future exams. Uh, it should be used in conjunction with other evidence as well. So it may be that um, 
the feedback is then discussed with educators, supervisors, clinical supervisors, uh, or at ARCPs, and uh, focus training is then put into place to ensure that uh, all the gaps are then uh, adequately covered uh, before the exam is attempted again. <clears throat> so for the part one exams, because they're mostly MCQs or EMQs, we tend to give um, the candidate score and pass score only. Um, it, it would be quite difficult to try and give uh, feedback for every single question uh, in, in that aspect. But even, even giving the candidate score does give you a fair idea of how close or how far away you are from uh, passing um, and, and gives you an, a measure of um, uh, whether the next attempt should be in six months or in 12 months as, as such. And most exams, uh, especially the part one, we, we do provide it twice a year and most exams part two also, we do provide it twice a year. There'll be some specialties where the exams are annual. For the part two exams, uh, there are lots of components involved. So we tend to give uh, feedback according to the component. So um, where candidates have passed, we'll just say, you know, they've passed certain uh, areas, but where they have uh, failed, uh, we will then give them uh, a summary of the reasons for the failure. So that gives a very good feedback to supervisors and the trainee themselves um, to uh, focus on, on certain aspects of the training before they attempt the exam again. So in terms of what are keys to your success, obviously the training program is extremely important um, so that you know you are trained by experienced trainers who although also have to go undergo their own training to be uh, able to be educational supervisors. Um, you have clear educational objectives which are then also measured uh, annually um, and st structured learning experience um, throughout your training period. And, and regular appraisal and um, broad ranging experience across the entire breadth of the curriculum. Um, and, and the FRC PATH exams are designed to make uh, assessment at certain milestones to make, ensure that uh, all that you need to gain from your training program according to the curriculum is being gained. Um, and also very important aspects are local, regional, and, and national training sessions in your training program. So again, reiterating that your part one exam uh, is, is testing knowledge. So take a long run up. Uh, it's very difficult to cram things into the last couple of months before your exam. I think uh, what's important here is that you gather the knowledge as you go along. Um, uh, and also looking at uh, ways of um, picking up the knowledge and there's a lot of resource out there um, but this is what your trainers will give you guidance on and, and adopt a systematic approach so it's almost like saying you know doing a, a certain amount uh, on a regular basis so that when you come up to to the exam you basically are revising uh, instead of actually learning for the first time and very important in most aspects of the pathology subspecialties to correlate your book knowledge with your ongoing day-to-day -day experience. And the more you do that, the easier it is uh, uh, for you to uh, recall it and it's, it's, it gets embedded into your system uh, so that uh, regurgitating it becomes uh, very, very easy. And very important to obtain regular feedback from your trainers. So not only in your day-to-day uh, -day practice and day-to-day -day experience, but also no harm in asking uh, for trainers uh, to set you uh, some exams or practice uh, papers and practice questions so that you know uh, how to measure uh, where you stand in, in terms of your training and your preparation for exams. Uh, part two, because it's skills and, and knowledge application, um, it's important to make sure that you cover um, the, the wide ranging experience that you really need uh, with regular feedback from your trainers, uh, which means say for instance in cellular pathology, um, you know, you look at a lot of glass slides or uh, nowadays uh, glass slides and digital 
slides as well, just to make sure that you, you cover as many entities as possible and are comfortable not only with um, pathology and abnormalities, but you're also comfortable with the wide range of normal appearances of, of tissues. And you can only do that when you tend to see lots of material on a day-to-day -day basis. In other specialties, obviously spend time in labs where um, you have to uh, make sure that you, again, you cover everything that uh, is, provide, uh, is supposed to be covered in your curriculum. So basically optimize all your clinical uh, opportunities. And as I've already said, especially for an approach to part two, get people to set you practical exercises so you are regularly tested and challenged. Um, also practice oral exam technique, but may, because many of these exams in the part two stage uh, do have uh, oral exam components as well. Um, so you, you do need practice in that too. And as you approach the exams, do mock exams as well. So many of your trainers and education supervisors will be examiners, so they will be able to set their own exam um, and, and give you guidance on, on um, uh, how exams are, are set uh, and should be approached. Um, so do follow their, follow their uh, guidance like that. And in many specialties, say again in cellular pathology, there um, are many commercial courses available which you may want to attend uh, although the college does not actually badge these at uh, these courses, but we do know that there are many uh, out there that do help to prepare towards the exams. So in terms of concluding thoughts, um, the exams provide a rigorous um, test of cognitive skills. Um, and again, part one, all about knowledge. So taking as much book work and, and journal work as possible and then part two, applying that and showing that you have obtained the skills uh, to progress in your training. And the exams do have to work together with the other forms of assessment uh, in order to test, uh, test and sample all aspects of the curriculum. So candidates who are fully engaged in a well-structured training program have a high probability of success. And, and I, I should say that those who are well prepared, um, take it in their stride, uh, do follow this approach of a long run up um, and, and uh, regularly apply their knowledge to ongoing practice, do tend to pass first time uh, in both parts of one and two. Um, the website uh, has, has already been mentioned uh, by Dr. Osborne. Um, you will find your information for trainees in that and then within that, uh, you have uh, specialty information as well. And then there's also, just as, I sh as I'm showing here, uh, examinations by specialty. So that's where you'll find regulations, generic as well as uh, specialty specific and, and um, sample questions as well. So thank you very much. Hopefully uh, that hasn't frightened anyone, but important to know uh, that during the course of your training, you will have um, these assessments uh, as, as milestones to, to cross over. Uh, but hopefully I've given you some degree of guidance and an overview as to how to approach them. Thank you very much. Great, okay. Um, thank you to everyone that's been um, putting their questions in. We are trying to work through them because there's quite a lot. So we're um, already um, typing a lot of the answers to the questions that you've asked. So please carry on asking those if you have any. Um, our next speaker is Dr. Matthew Clark, who is the chair of the Trainees Committee. Um, Matthew will talk through um, his role with you, but really important to emphasize that um, Matthew has a very uh, close working relationship as chair of the TAC um, with the learning team. Um, and we are in touch quite often, just um, checking in, making sure um, everything's progressing. And as I said earlier, we meet um, twice a year with the whole TAC um, just to give them any updates and discuss any issues. So over to you, Matthew. 
Thank you very much, Joe. Thank you for the introduction and good afternoon, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to meet you all. Um, sorry it's not face to face, but hopefully um, over the course of um, your training, we'll get to meet at some point at various different meetings. Um, so as I, Joe said, my, my name is Dr. Matt Clark. I'm the current um, chair of the Royal College Trainees Advisory Committee, um, and I'm also a diagnostic neuropathology trainee and clinical lecturer. And also I am the current chair of the Academy of Medical Royal College's trainee doctors group as well. So it's a pleasure to be able to meet you today, um, although virtual, and hopefully give you a little overview about the role of the committee, um, what we do um, on a daily basis, and also at the end, how you can get involved with it as well. So first of all, I um, just wanted to say from me a big welcome to you to the, the, the specialty of pathology. Um, some of you I may have met at various different engagement events um, in recent months or over the last couple of years and fantastic that you've decided to join the specialty and I hope in the first few weeks uh, you've actually you're enjoying it um, and starting to find your feet as well. Um, very pleased to welcome you and you've made the right choice I can definitely assure you of that um, I haven't changed my mind or regretted my decision since I moved over to pathology and I hope um, as the course of your training goes on you will still feel the same as well um, we're facing quite difficult circumstances as a specialty at the moment um, so there are big pressures we've had as a result of the pandemic but also as the reinstitution of services and um, with a backlog on the NHS um, this of course affects a lot of the, the clinical the frontline specialties but of course the pathology being central to all of those um, we also have a knock-on impact as well so very challenging workforce pressures at the moment um, first of all also this has been a challenge throughout the pandemic um, for all of us and I'm sure you throughout your early years of training and foundation doctors or even if you come from other other specialties as well um, there have been major challenges that we've all gone through um, and in the pre in the last couple of years as well and and in the where our services have been trying to be re-implemented and dealing with the NHS backlog. So thank you very much to you all for all that you've done to actually help support that in this process. Um, and just to bear in mind as well that with these increased pressures, training may look a little bit different to usual. Um, training recovery is very much underway, um, but just bear with, with the departments as they um, as they adjust to the new, um, new strategies and the new um, methods to ensure that everything is at your fingertips that you're going to need um, throughout your training. But hopefully, um, as I said, things will, you'll, you'll have been settled in now and you're finding your feet and with the help of the other trainees in the departments. So what is the Trainees Advisory Committee? Well, it's a committee of trainee representatives and we have over 30, um, 30 members, which is a fantastically uh, great committee. It has representation from all 17 pathology training specialties. Um, so we get input from all, all the areas of pathology um, and from people at different training stages as well. And also trainees who are working less than full time. So we cover all the spectrum of training um, across pathology. Um, we also have trainee representatives that sit on other committees as well as, as Joe mentioned, just now we have a we're really proud of the relationship that we have with the the college and the teams within the college as well and so the college are extremely keen for us to um, be part of the ongoing work and projects that they do and so there is trainee representation on the vast majority of committees and projects um, that the college are engaged with and some examples of the different committees that we're part of include the examinations committee the medical examiners committee there's also the digital pathology committee that i'm a part of um, there's also the diversity and inclusion network um, and also the individual specialty advisory committees that trainee representatives will be a part of as well. And you each, each of us have a valuable input to try and get the trainee viewpoint across and provide some input into the ongoing work of each of those committees. So it's re a really important role and a really um, something we're really proud of. Each of these representatives provides a report about the meetings that they've uh, they've been to and the work that they're doing as part of these committees, um, ready for our meetings so that everybody can review what the ongoing progress is and where we as a committee can provide some support to those different um, different aspects as well. As Joe mentioned, we meet twice a year um, in May and November, but we have contact throughout. So it's not in between those times we're not doing anything. Um, this is a committee that's active at all times. Um, and so that's the, we, we're grateful to hear from you if there are any issues during that time as well and we can try and do our best to action those as best as we can and as as i mentioned one of the key aspects of this is that we are really valued by the college and we work together with the college to help make improvements to your training um, and uh, yeah, any changes that need to be implemented from the trainee perspective as well 
So what is the actual role of the TAC? Um, well, we're here to represent every single one of you. That's our, our main goal. And um, we can put forward your concerns or any queries that you might have to the college related to your training or any other aspects of your, um, your time within pathology. Um, we also are asked to review documents, um, a new curricula, and provide training, valuable training input for various different projects. Um, we've had a lot of involvement as a result of the Jubilee celebrations this year of the college, um, but there are other projects that are always going on, whether that's particular events that trainees are involved with um, or other work that the wider work that the college is doing also. And what we're ultimately trying to do is training it can, be a, it can be a challenge and that's no matter what specialty you're actually working in, uh, training is a, is a challenge and a struggle at times and we're doing our best to, to Im try and make implement some changes or alterations to make that whole process as straightforward and as easy as we possibly can for you. Um, and if you have any concerns regarding your training, it's imp really important that you, that you let us know so that we can try and take things forward for you. If we don't hear anything from you, then we're assuming that everything is okay. So it's important that when you have the opportunity and you, if, you, if you want to contact us, please do. Um, we have a very open door policy and are willing to hear from you about any issues that you might be concerned with. And we'll, like I said, do our best to try and help um, bring about some changes if we can. Um, one of the other things that we like to do is provide contributions to the trainee section of the college publication, the college bulletin, and we would love to hear from you if you would like to contribute as well. So frequently there are trainee submissions as part of that. If you've got a particular opinion that you want to express about something or something that you, a, a particular aspect about your specialty or to provide your view about what the early phases of your training have, has been like, these are all things that the editor of the bulletin would be keen to hear from you about as well. So do get in touch um, and it's an opportunity for you to practice your submission media skills um, and written communication and publications as well. So plenty of opportunities to get involved in that as well. We have a dedicated um, page on the website. Um, some of you may have seen this already, so do please um, do take a look at that and you'll find lots of training related resources as well to peruse through and some information that, and if, if there are any, anything that's unclear, you may find information available at the, on the website um, that may guide you through bit different aspects of your training. And these are just some of the committee representatives that we have on the committee at the moment. So I'm the chair. Um, I have a vice chair, Dr. Rachel Rummery, who's a paediatric pathology trainee. And as you can see, there are different representatives covering lots of different areas of, of this of the specialties um, and you can contact any one of these about any particular issues related to your specific aspect of training. Um, so how does it work? Well, we meet in May and November, as I mentioned. At the moment, these are virtual meetings, um, which helps to facilitate um, the, the maximum amount of trainees who are able to attend. And in 10 weeks in advance of the meeting, you'll hear from Jenny, um, who will contact you via email and ask, uh, ask you to submit questions or queries via a website portal that opens up during this time. And you can submit any, as many questions as you actually like. And then these, were, these are then passed on to the Director of Learning, Joe Brinklow, and the examination and Director of Examinations, to kindly formulate or take the time to formulate a response for us and then we're given these responses in advance of the meeting and then during that we can, we actually have the privilege of these officers actually joining us for part of the TAC meeting where we can discuss these responses and if there is anything else that we need to take forward related to those so it's a really good opportunity for us to meet with the senior team of the college and discuss any pertinent issues um, relevant to your training. And so we have the Director of Learning who joins us, Joe, who you've met, Clinical Director of Training and Assessment, the Vice President for Learning, and also the Director of Examinations. So many of the senior executive team of the college join us. Um, any trainee that submits a query to the to the meeting will then receive a formal answer to that query as well. And we're looking about putting up um, some of the most frequent questions that come to us on the website as a resource for you going forward as well. So you may find that a question that you have has already been addressed within our meeting. And you will also be able to see the minutes of the meeting, TAC meetings as well as they will be found up on the, on the college website. We're also really lucky to have an update from our president who joins us for part of the meeting as well. And again, that's an opportunity for us to hear the work Work that he's been up to at the moment but also for us to feed back any issues that we think he needs to be aware of as well so we have a really good working relationship as a committee but with the senior members of the team being integral to the functioning of the TAC as well and we're also really lucky to have administrative support from the college in the form of Alison Morgan who um, is a fantastic help to me um, in the daily running of the committee and the administrative side of things as well so we couldn't do it without the help of Alison 
So what are the sort of activities and projects and ongoing work that Trainee Advisory Committee has been involved with um, for the last few years? Well, these are all things that we think are really important. Um, and some of these things are ongoing. Some of them have been completed um, and some are still to be still to happen as well. But one of the things that we've been particularly proud of is in the last few years, we've been implementing an, an ongoing campaign against anti-bullying anti and harassment campaign. And this is something that sadly is a real issue for most specialties within medicine and even in science as well. Um, but the college takes an absolutely zero tolerance approach to this. Um, and although we're one of the specialties where there are fewer incidences of it, in our view, one incident is far too many. And so what we've been trying to do is to get people talking about it to make sure that these situations cannot be hidden away. And different trusts and deaneries have approaches in place to actually deal with this if any of these sort of strategies, any of these things actually happen. So you should feel supported if you do encounter it or witness any of these situations. There are mechanisms in place now to, to help with this and you should be able to find on the college website more information about our campaign but we've also been linking into <coughs> excuse me other colleges that have been part of this as well one of the things I'm not going to go into too much detail about, as you're hearing, you'll hear a presentation from Joe Martin shortly. Um, but one of the things that the trainees um, and the committee have been heavily involved in is the RCPATH Health Education England Pathology Portal, which was launched yesterday. So very hot off the press, and a fantastic time for you as new trainees to join uh, join the specialty um, at, with the advent of this. And it's a digital learning platform that's uh, providing a huge wealth of resources to trainees. Um, and although it's initially been launched for trainees and his with resources for histopathology, cytopathology, autopsy, and neuropathology, the other specialties are having resources developed as we speak at the moment. So it won't be long before these are released also, but it's going to be a fantastic thing to help support your training going forward. One of the other things we've been heavily involved in, particularly during the pandemic as well, is providing well-being and support resources for trainees and providing um, information on the website via this as well and links to things that might help you. And we've also been involved in work about reporting of errors and mistakes in pathology, and we regularly involved with the patient safety awareness work of the college. One of the things that I like about pathology is we, we all as a human, a human beings will make mistakes in our career and even on our, you know, on our daily job and perhaps even more than one. But what we have to do is make sure that we're open and honest about these things to make sure that um, others can learn from that. And that's something that I think is really a key part of pathology and what you will see a lot of the senior team doing. And so what we've tried to do is encourage groups of trainees to get together and talk about these errors and mistakes that may happen so that we can try and prevent others from, ha uh, others from happening in the future to these uh, to other trainees and ensure that we derive the learning from them that we can. We're really proud as well to be involved in the diversity and inclusion network as part of the college. Um, I sit on the commit on in the network and so does my vice chair, um, Rachel, um, and we try and do the very best we can to try and promote an inc inclusive nature of our committee and are always looking at ways of trying to improve this and into the larger work of this, um, this, this work stream with the college also. One of the things we, do, we love doing is our engagement, public engagement events. And some of you, in fact, may have attended this over the previous few years, and maybe why you're, you've joined us from the specialty uh, in the specialty now. But we hold a Royal College BDIAP Foundation and Undergraduate Taster event, where junior doctors and medical students can actually join us for an evening and hear about some of the benefits um, of what a career in pathology can actually offer you, and provide a mystery case um, presentation as well, where you, we use the different pathology specialties to highlight their role um in a diagnosis of a patient who comes in very unwell into the hospital so there are lots of opportunities of engagement events throughout the year and we're always looking for other trainees to get involved with these as well so do if it's something you're interested in do listen out for these opportunities We've also got an event to let you know about um, coming up on the 27th of September a virtual event um, which is a not in the textbooks study day so there are lots of um, things to learn within your curriculum, but there are also some things which may not be so easily covered by the curriculum. And so this is the aim of this study day is to provide you with some uh, some useful um, information and talks related to these subjects. So, for example, things about mentoring and um, about training, preparing yourself for becoming a consultant or a senior member of the team, um, independent reporting and digital pathology as well. So quite a diverse um, a group of talks, but something that's aimed for all training trainees, no matter their stage of training, but also no matter what the specialty is. So if you'd like to register for that or would like to see some more information about that, do visit the college website and where you'll find me more details about the programme as well. 
One of the things that during the pandemic we've been particularly active with is trying to work out and assess the impact on training of the pandemic as well. And so one of the things that the committee did with the Association of Clinical Pathologists is to put together a, a, a training impact survey which explored the different impacts um, of the pandemic on different aspects of training across the different specialties. And the report that was derived from this has been really useful to feed into the, um, the discussions from the, the devolved nations and other um, body organizations that are responsible for the provision of funding within training as well um, to help make sure that we're, we're supporting and targeting particular areas of training recovery that need to be addressed within our specialty as well. So we're really involved in trying to make improvements um, post pandemic um, and in the recovery phase. We've also worked very closely with the learning team to develop a What I Wish I'd Known series, which was a series of videos produced by senior trainees who've been through the exam process. Um, they're very short videos, but it covers the different specialties. And we asked the trainees to think about what they'd wish they'd known before, if, the, if the, when they go into these exams, are there any hints or tips that they can provide trainees who are thinking about sitting the exams of what they could, um, which may help them going forward as well. And you can again find links to these videos on the college website. And this is again an ongoing project, so we're still seeking some other other videos from other senior uh, trainees in the specialties as well. Um, other things that we've been doing. So my, sorry, just my um, my mouse paused for a moment. Um, Joe Martin um, also pro um, and has provided a series of sessions looking at the art and science of practical management that were chaired by me um, a, a, a couple of years ago now. But these were, if you're interested in as topics related to leadership and management within the specialty or within the wider NHS and medicine. This is a really good series of videos that you may be interested in exploring more about um, and uh, learning a bit more about Jo's extensive experience um, and her advice to you on getting involved in these various different aspects as well. So do take a look at the website if you want further details about that. The other highlight within pathology is National Pathology Week, and this is where our engagement events really come to fruition. And so there are lots of opportunities to get involved in these various different things. And the TAC are always very much a prominent part of these activities during this week as well. And this week, it's actually just past because it was part of our Jubilee celebrations. Um, but do look out for future ones and for events that are going to be um, happening related to this. And we also, one of our running, current running themes with the committee and our ongoing work is just getting training back on track to where it needs to be um, post pandemic. And this leads into things like feedback on examinations and assessments, which the, the different representatives on the committee are very good at providing us with. Um, and much, much more. I could go on for a long, long time talking about the other different projects, but hopefully this is just giving you a snapshot of the variety of different things that we as a committee are involved with and that we try and do and implement on, on your behalf. One of the things just to mention is very, I think no matter which specialty you end up going in, you're, you're working in, digital, we're very much in the digital era of pathology and different departments across the country are moving over to digitizing their cases now. And so this will be affecting you. You may be in a department already where this is very much at, um, at, at in, in practice or one that where this is being developed currently. But this is where things are transitioning in pathology and the, the arrival of the pathology portal is one of the heralding parts of this that's going to really help boost and improve and um, make significant changes changes within our training as well. So what advice would I give you, um, certainly from my perspective, about your approach to training? And I expect you've heard some, from a lot of this from people who already have spoken this morning. Um, but one of the things I'd like to emphasize is that within pathology, there's no competition amongst you. We're, depending on your specialty, again, and your setup within your department, my experience has been that we're all, as trainees, sat in the same reporting room together, um, and we're there to learn together. And so don't be afraid, particularly at your stage, to ask questions. And that's, what's abs that's absolutely what is expected. Um, no one expects you to know anything about the specialty other than basically what it is um, at, at your stage. And so it's a very steep learning curve in the first year, but stick with it and enjoy the learning opportunities that you'll get with it. It will be frequent that you'll hear senior team, senior members of the team with an interesting case that they'll show you, perhaps gather you all around the, um, the multi-header microscope or around the digital screen. It's a really good opportunity to learn from your colleagues um, about interesting cases and the approaches that they have to cases as well. And the vast, the, one of the big things as you've just heard from Dr. Manick, his experience is a major part of allowing you to get through the assessments, but also making sure that you're a competent pathologist after you get through that and you start thinking about senior positions within your, within your department. One of the other things I would encourage you to do is 
to meet people and go to conferences and meetings um, and courses and liaise with your other colleagues and your trainees in different departments. And there's a lot of shared learning that can be had between you. Um, so get to know your get to know co your colleagues and you will end up making a lot of friends for life potentially um, as a result of this. I always enjoy going to pathology conferences and it's a good opportunity to hear about the latest research work that's going on, but also the opportunity to meet some of the experts in the field um, and thinking it helps you to think about the different specializations that you might want to consider going forward as well. I certainly, from my perspective, think that pathology is one of the specialties of medicine that provides some of the most fantastic opportunities to get involved in other things. So if you like teaching, if you like academic or research work, if you like leadership and management, there are lots of opportunities for you to engage with, it in, within, with this in, these, in this specialty as well. And there's time and provision available to do that. So speak to your colleagues about it, speak to your supervisors and your training program directors about these opportunities and jump at them if, you, if, you feel, if you're interested and want to do them. I can tell you from my perspective, they've been very well, well worth exploring. Um, and it's a lifelong learning process. So although you're, you're, you're at the moment thinking you're at the early stages, you're training and thinking about getting towards the end of it, and that's it, becoming a consultant or maybe an SAS doctor or some a senior position within pathology, there are, it doesn't just stop there. And I think one of the former Royal College presidents says you are always going to be a trainee. So even as a consultant, there'll be cases that you you don't know what the answer is, but the, the experience and the training that you get will teach you how to deal and cope with that case. And that's one of the beauties of this specialty. There are always opportunities to learn new things. And that's why I love it, um, love it so much because of that constant continual learning. And one of the other things I was involved with a couple of years ago is a future of pathology report, probably more specific to those amongst you who are histopathology trainees. Um, but this provide this was some work I did with um, three other trainees from around the world, looking about perspectives on molecular pathology, artificial intelligence, digital pathology, and perceptions of pathology as well, um, and how things are changing going forward. And it was used to try and influence um, the C-suite administrative um, executive teams of different hospital trusts to think about how we need to provision for the future of pathology as well. And some of you may find this interesting to read about how things may be changing going forward um, as, a, as we go through as a profession. Pathology, I think, is one of the most cutting edge specialties. It's very fast changing. Um, and I think it's that for that reason, it's very exciting to be part of the specialty. And hopefully you'll think about feel feel the same as you go through. As I mentioned, one of the things that the committee have been involved with is a lot of well-being and support, and we work very closely with the college in trying to develop resources and provide the support that trainees need, um, as we all have times where we may struggle, and it's about knowing where to turn for that help that you may need. So help is available. I think that's a key message to say. Help is available from you if you for you if you are struggling, but also look out for each other. And as you get to know each other, um, you will get to know each other. That we all have it, that it challenges with training. We may have challenges in our personal lives as well. But always, if someone's not doesn't see themselves, perhaps just offer to take them for a coffee or just have a chat with them. And sometimes that may be enough just to say, "Are you okay?" Um, and can allow them to give them some. Um, confidence to, uh, to open up about the, the challenges that they may be experiencing. Um, other trainees find engaging with things like coaching and reflective practice, uh, reflective partnerships can be very useful. That's something I've engaged with both of those and they have been really useful to me. So look out for opportunities to get involved with those and speak with your supervisors and your training program directors who have a huge wealth of experience of helping trainees through training as well. So engagement with them at an early stage is really important and they know their doors are open and expect you to come and speak to them if there are any, any issues. There's also resources related to mentoring. Um, many of the different pathology organizations that you may be able to consider joining have mentoring schemes associated with them. So look at, look at websites and consider joining these for opportunities, but also speak to us on the TAC. Our emails are always open, our phones are always on, so please get in touch if we potentially can support you in any way. During the pandemic, um, I provided drop-in sessions for trainees on an evening basis. This is still open. If anybody wants to speak to me directly about any particular challenges that they've got related yeah. to their training or others at the moment, then please do, do get in touch. Um, and also I would advise you just to think about your work-life balance as well. It can be very easy to sway the wrong way in favor of work, but it's really important that you take the time out to have a break um, and re recharge your batteries to, make, uh, to get yourself through. 
that we need to get away from this idea that being a good doctor means you have to dedicate all the hours of all every week to work. Um, the good doctor is someone who can do their work competently and efficiently, but also has a life outside of their work as well. And to truly appreciate um, what you do and enjoy your specialty, um, you need to be able to enjoy that break as well. Since being chair of the committee, one of the things I've wanted to do is try and improve communication with trainees. And so one of the, several of the things that we've done is provide update emails throughout the year, um, providing you with information about the latest developments and projects that are ongoing and events that you might be interested in as well. Um, I'm a regular user of Twitter. And I use, I look after the Training Advisory Committee Twitter account, which is at Pathology House. So this is where I can again provide information about events that may be suitable to you or different things that you may want to look at related to training. So please, if you use Twitter, do follow me on that. Um, as I mentioned, we have features in the, the RC Path Bulletin as well, which you might be interested in. And just a key message as well, although we only have two, we have two meetings a year, we're working all year round for you. So please do get in touch with us if we can help in any way going forward. So finally, can you actually get involved? Well, absolutely. We need support and help from the trainee body and all the projects that we're going get, getting involved in. We do this work alongside our existing training as well. So having support from the wider trainee body is always very gratefully received. We're also regularly seeking new representation. Um, so do keep an eye on, and there, I think there is an election open at the moment for particular roles. So do keep an eye on the college website. And it may be something that you're thinking about perhaps dipping your toe in and getting involved in some uh, leadership and management work. This would be an ideal opportunity for you to consider that. So do look, keep, do keep an eye out on the, for emails and on the trainee advisory committee website for these opportunities as they arise. And you can follow, I will provide information by this via the Twitter account. And finally, just to give you my email addresses, um, and if anybody wants to get in touch with me for any reason um, related to training or otherwise, then please feel free to do so. But finally, just to say again, welcome to the specialty. Um, I hope you will enjoy it as much as I do. And I look forward to meeting you hopefully face to face at a meeting very soon. Thank you. Thank you so much, Matthew. That's brilliant. Um, so we have our final talk of the afternoon now coming up, um, which is from Professor Joe Martin. Uh, Joe is the immediate past president of the college, um, but since she's left, she's kept herself extraordinarily busy um, developing the pathology portal, which was formally launched yesterday. And Joe's going to tell us all about it now. So over to you, Joe. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Um, really warm welcome and uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you about this. Um, I'm going to share my screen and do it live, um, which is always daunting. Um, I'm So it's sort of like real life. I'm going to share my screen. Um, if you can if you can see this, please let me know. I am, it says I'm screen sharing, but I don't know whether you can actually see this currently. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we can see that, Joe. Fantastic. Okay, so we were concerned that uh, a lot of the digital resources around were transient and a lot of the digital res uh, resources around were not arranged to support your learning didn't come with questions, didn't come with uh, additional resources. There's some great and fantastic uh, digital image libraries around. Um, and so we've worked with the Technology Enhanced Le uh, Learning uh, team at uh, Health Education England, who have been fabulous. And we've worked with our trainee uh, colleagues to produce um, some real big changes um, to the Health Education Learning Hub. Um, to form the pathology portal. And this is it live. Um, this is Learning Hub. If you just Google Learning Hub NHS, you'll come up with this page and you should be registered for it already or you can just register. Um, top catalogues um, here, pathology portal. If you go into this, you'll see where we are with this. And this is... A, a portal that will be available for all pathology disciplines ultimately, but currently we've just gone live with anything that says live on here, histopathology, cytopathology, autopsy and forensic. And 
within this spine of materials, we've got huge um, resources that will help you during your learning journey. Um, massive kudos to all the um, amazing editors. So we've got, you know, really world-class people um, helping support this. I'm going to show you just a couple of the um, examples of, of, um, of this. Um, I'm going to go to my bookmarks, which are up here. Bookmarks. So you can bookmark any resources. I'm going to show you one that is produced for Neuropath within the Neuropath section by someone who might just have been talking to you a moment or two ago. And this includes things like, I'm going to hide the controls for a minute, whole slide images. Um, it includes annotated whole slide images. Um, it includes questions here. You might have to help me with uh, what label five is. There we go. Let's see what that is. So I'm going to guess here. So don't hate, don't hate me on this, Matthew. Let me have a look. Let's move it in. Okay, I'm going to move it out again. Five. Yeah. So I'm going to move it in here. Whoops, sorry, I pressed the wrong button there. So we've got the clinical information, we've got the whole slide image, it's what's question five. Um, it will give you an answer there. I think that was the right answer. Good. Um, this is an eosinophilic body. And then you'll go on to answer further questions. A lot of these um, materials and the modules here have tremendous depth of, of knowledge. Some of them are very simple. They're sort of one or two minute uh, modules. Others have got detailed um, molecular uh, diagnostic information within them, particularly in the neuropath, which is fantastic. Other ones, for example, have great, um, this isn't a case from the autopsy one. So again, we've got whole slide imaging here. Um, and in this one, this is one by Esther, who's a post-mortem uh, pathologist specialist now, general pathologist, but with post-mortem specialist. And she's actually done a video of the features. You won't be able to hear this because of, of the format we're using. Um, Hi, my name's Esther Yowd. And, and she's, I'm gonna she's going to talk, she talks you through that particular case, zooming in and zooming out and showing you all the particular features. And then there's a, uh, a reference link to, to look at more of that. These particular resources in the autopsy will be invaluable for anyone doing um, the CAT as well, the Certificate of Higher Autopsy Training. Um, and there are a range of other types of resources in all of those, um, in all of those areas. I'm going to go back into the homepage. So access the Learning Hub. Go into the portal. You can actually get there by typing in pathology portal. You can bookmark the page here. You can add a bookmark um, to that particular page as I've already done here. You can add a bookmark to it. So you can go in straight next time. And then you can have a look through all the various um, areas. I particularly commend to you also um, the Gynae cytology um, modules as well. We know it's difficult for people to uh, sometimes um, see uh, cytology if you're not a cytology centre, um, but Tanya Levine from the London Regional Training Centre has done astonishing work on this with talk throughs, video introductions to um, a whole range of conditions in addition to um, a whole range of case studies here. So for example, this is a simple image-based case and you can see 
that's a that's a straightforward teaching one and there are other ones with questions and uh, with comments on individual cases so there is an absolute wealth of very basic through to quite complex uh, learning here we've had some amazing contributions also from the uh, international community and in particular you can see how much material we've got here uh, in particular uh, we've got tremendous contributions um, all across skin pathology and the dermatopathology uh, section and we've aggregated um, some amazing video teaching sessions from some of the world's best pathologists um, all talking about um, their particular areas of interest. So I would encourage you to sign up um, and to have a have a rummage. Um, I'm going to stop sharing now. Um, so have a rummage through the content, um, have a look through. It's arranged in, uh, several of the areas are arranged in levels, so let, work your way up from level zero sometimes. Um, level one, level two, level three, level four, level five, roughly arranged in the sort of years that you might be expected to progress on. So the complicated stuff is in the, in the years in level four and five. Um, level one is, is where you might start. Um, but it means that you can brush up at your own pace. Um, increasingly, there will be more material added. So keep an eye on uh, the content. Uh, it's being arranged in case one and up. So start at the bottom of the spine and work your way up uh, where appropriate, not with the videos, but, but do that, do that in, um, in ascending order. Um, there's a learning record. Uh, if you if you go to the top, there's a my learning and you can produce a you can print a copy of what you've accessed and any tests you've taken uh, for your portfolio. We can't download it automatically at the moment, but you can um, you can print it out or PDF it for, for future use um, in your uh, ARCP. In the. Um, in the future, we'll have some more upgrades as well as more content. And there's lots more quiz formats coming in. Uh, at the moment, there are some quizzes, there's some questions, um, there's some formative quizzes with some feedback, and there's some summative quizzes with no feedback, basically exam style stuff. And more of those will be going up. There aren't a lot of quizzes at the moment. We've been concentrating on getting content up for you. Um, it's uh, There are some areas which are hugely densely populated um, there's some other areas which which more content will be going up over the next week or two and over the next um, uh, month uh, or so so keep an eye on it we'll tweet when there's more stuff coming up um, and I don't know uh, whether you have any particular questions um, or suggestions for me uh, can you add cases from the Learning Hub to your portfolio? Absolutely. You can, um, again, you, you, you can print out that um, record um, and add that to the portfolio activity. Absolutely. Um, that's, that's, uh, that's the intention. So anything that you, all the videos that you watch, you can add that activity to your portfolio, the cases that you do. Um, it will be a small, it will be a relatively small number compared with your surgical ones, um, but you will be able to add that, add that there. Um, any other questions, queries, suggestions? There's just that one, Joe, but I think you've answered that already in your talk about can we add cases from the Learning Hub to our portfolio yeah. activity? So yeah. yes, but yeah. it won't, right. it's not, not automatically, but yes, yeah. you can. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We, 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 that's uh, that's on the development pipeline. That's something that we've asked for, um, but we will um, uh, we will have it eventually. But I'm not going to promise it's going to be within the next month or two because it's quite um, 
uh, it's quite interesting to try and um, uh, predict the development pipeline. We've got some new, nice new quiz formats coming in, uh, including quizzes on annotations on whole slides and mix, mix and match format for questions, which will be nice for the molecular side as well um, on that. Just a huge thank you to all the people who've helped develop it. The learning team at the college have been fantastic in supporting this. Uh, Ruth and Luke, the portal officers, um, have been uh, supporting users and uh, helping gain people gain access. The TEL team have been fantastic and the trainee, um, trainee editors and the, and the editors have been absolutely brilliant. Um, I hope you find it useful. Um, uh, oh, somebody said the portal looks great. That's very kind of you, but do also feel free um, to feedback, um, you know, things, developments that you'd like to see. Bear in mind, we can't always uh, deliver instantly on these things, and we do have a wish list of stuff. Um, all the trainees and the pathologists who've helped, helped us with um, development on this and user um, experience uh, sessions have also been much appreciated uh, on that. And similarly, wish list for, wish list for portals, uh, for, for uh, topics. Um, so we know that, so medical renal, there's a lot more going up over the next couple of weeks. Um, so you don't need to nag us about that one because we, we know that and I've got some fantastic contributions and we're gonna have some of the EQA slides um, uh, from previous uh, circulations will be added to that along with um, the learning that goes with it. Um, and if you want to get involved in, in adding stuff as well, please, please help with that. Brilliant. That's great. Thank you so much, Joe. Thank you. Um, sorry, there was a, just a question about how do you get access? So you, you just request access to it. So you go into the Learning Hub and then request access. Um, I and the learning team will get an email about it. So uh, Karen, it, and, and we'll, get, we'll get an email and then we'll uh, approve you. Um, it's a restricted one, basically, because there is some sensitive content on it. Um, but uh, if, you, if you're a... Path trainee, you'll get instant access. Uh, well, instant. It'll take a minute or two for, once we've approved it. Okay. Thank Thanks. you, Joe. Thank okay. you. Excellent. I'll say goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Over to you, Nikki. Thanks, Joe. So I, I can see. Thank you for a, a wonderful session, everyone. It'll be great to be able to put this up. Um, on the web, which we will do shortly, just for, for kind of future questions as they crop up during the year. Um, I'd like to thank our speakers for doing such a great job today. Um, I hope you've all found it useful. This is, to my mind, the beginning of the relationship that we hope you'll all have with your college, with, with the college, really through till you retire. Claire and I, I guess, we're, we're somewhere along, along those lines, as is, as is Matt, but uh, many years to go. Um, so do get in touch as and when you need to. Um, some questions are best answered by us. Some questions are going to be answered by your deanery along the way. Well, you know, we, we share information where we can, where it's useful um, with you. But do get in, in touch if you're having problems either through the TAC or through emailing the training team. I'm not sure that there are any more questions to answer at the moment. Uh, there's just one that's come up. Um... Just, I think it's just someone saying that they have just been able to log in um, to the pathology portal. So, yeah. excellent. That's great. You can come in. <laughs> thank you. So, if, if that's it and there are no more questions for today, then, then we'll, once again, thank you all. And I'm sure we'll see you again soon at our, at our ongoing training event. Take care.